All right, welcome to week six. We are almost halfway through the term. We are done with the heavy duty theory. That's the good news. So all the theory is pretty much out of the way. This is getting to be more the practical side of the database work. And what is the practical side of database work? The biggest chunk of it is SQL. And today's lecture is the introduction to SQL. And today I'm going to cover a bit of history. I'm going to teach you guys about uh, the DDL, which is the data definition language. And I'm going to teach you guys about how to add data to your database. It's the very simplest side of it. Um, this stuff doesn't really change once you know how to do it. That is what it is. Um, this is where reference manuals come in handy because this is you know, all online. You can find it all over the internet. OK, first, the history lesson. SQL is a special purpose programming language. It's designed to do one thing. Now, in the world of programming, there's two kinds of languages. There's a special purpose language and general purpose languages. A, an example of a general purpose language would be Java or PHP or C++. It's a language that lets you write pretty much any kind of thing you want. A special purpose language is a language that's been created to do one job and do it really well. Examples of this, there's a language called R. Anybody here ever do statistics? Did you ever hear of R? That's a special purpose language. It's designed to do stats. SQL is a special purpose language. It's designed to talk to a database. That's what it does. That's all there is to it. It was created by IBM. In the early 70s, that's how old this language is. It's been around for longer than me. So it's been around for over 40 some odd years. And it was, believe it or not, it was created by IBM at first. Originally, it was called SQL, literally written like SQL. It stood for Structured English Query Language. Thus, as the SQL people tend to keep pronouncing it as SQL, which is really bad for two reasons, and I'll explain what they are in a second. Uh, the first reason, IBM had to drop the name SQL because they were going to get sued. Because somebody had already created a database language called SQL. And there's a small company in the UK. And the second IBM says, we created this language called SQL Talk to Database. These guys said, lawsuit. IBM said, never mind. You know, IBM could have just written a check and bought this company. They chose not to. I guess the other product sucked. I don't know. They had no reason to buy out this other company. It wasn't worth it for the trademark. So reason number one why you shouldn't call SQL SQL is because it's not SQL. SQL belongs to someone else and the company no longer exists, but the trademark still exists. Go figure that one out. Number two, SQL is what's called an initialism, not an acronym. An acronym is something you pronounce, like FIFA, you pronounce. SQL, if you pronounce it, it'd be squall. It's an initialism. You pronounce the letters, not the word. Just so you know, that's just my pet peeve. It pisses me off when I hear teachers use it, call it a sequel. The first commercial version was for Oracle. So IBM created it, and Oracle was the first to come to market with it. IBM created it, published a standard, and the Oracle guys whipped one out really fast. And what was it for? Oracle version 2 for VAX. VAX isn't around anymore. Neither is the company that created it. Oracle still is. In 1986, the very first SQL standard was established. There is actually an official standard that is run by various uh, standard agencies. So every couple of years, they get together and say, what new features do we need to add to this language? And then they all, all these corporations hash it out, and they come up with a standard that everybody ignores. But there is a standard. So the very first standard is SQL 86. It defined the basics of the language. The 1999 standard was the standard that most database servers recognize. If you learn SQL 99, you're good. It covers the most complex functionality added to databases since they were created initially. Currently, last I checked, we're at SQL 2011. There's 2003, 2006, and 2008. And most of that stuff included XML, which was supposed to be the godsend for data, which we all discovered was useless. 
Uh, they added instead of, which is special functionality. I'll talk about that later in the term. And truncate, I actually do talk about today. Truncate is something that, that existed for 10 years before it was accepted in the standard. It's just nobody wanted to put it in the standard. It's just what it is. Now, that's the history lesson. SQL is a three-part language. It's made up of three different pieces. And each piece has a very specific job. The first piece is known as the DDL, the Data Definition Language. It creates and maintains the database structure and the objects in the database. So these are tables, views, uh, adding columns, that kind of stuff. That's DDL. That's the construction company. So the database design stuff you learned up till now was the architecture firm. The DDL is the guys that come and put up the house for you. The DML is the data manipulation language. It's the one that plays with the contents inside the database. So the data itself is touched using the DML. And that's to create, maintain data, add data, update the data, delete the data, that kind of stuff. It, that's its purpose in life. That is the place where 99% of your coding is in the database. After the database structure is created, rarely do you need to go touch it again, right? Your house is built, your house is built. Occasionally, you'll put in a new door, you'll put a new window, you'll put new counters in. But you don't do that every day. You do it you know, every 10 years or so. On the other hand, how often do you repaint your house? How often do you add a piece of furniture, change a piece of furniture, buy a new spatula for your kitchen? That is the DML. It plays with the contents of your structure. The DCL is the security side of the deal. You will not be learning that this term. That is a database administration thing. It is not database agnostic. Some of the commands are similar, but pretty much every server does it differently. And part of this course is to teach you guys the generics of the database system, not the specifics to one. There could be an entire course dedicated to DCL. I've taught it in a different course, and it usually took two lectures to cover DCL. And by the time they were done, they knew about 5% of it. The 5% was what would do 90% of the work. But it's still, you know, there's a lot to learn and it's not really part of this. It's more of a database administration type course. Okay, the SQL language is case insensitive. The keywords are not case sensitive. So unlike Java where uppercase if is not the same thing as lowercase if, in SQL, the word alter is the same whether it's uppercase or lowercase. It doesn't care. What is case sensitive usually is the name of the objects, the table names, the column names, views, indexes, all those bits and pieces. The names of the things are case sensitive. And depending on the database server, the data is usually case sensitive also. So uppercase Dan versus mixed case Dan or lowercase Dan is not the same thing. But actually, you guys should know this already in Java where a string written one way is not equivalent to the same string written a different way. So if you have a string ABC, lowercase is not the same thing as uppercase ABC. The database is the same for the most part. There are a few databases, out, servers out there that break this rule. MySQL is the first one that comes to mind. MySQL is not case sensitive and it makes life hard for some things, even though some people think case insensitive is the way it should be. Oracle may or may not be, depending what options you've set up. Microsoft SQL Server is case sensitive, unless you tell it not to be. Different servers do it differently. IBM DB2 is case sensitive. Ingress is case sensitive. You know, case sensitivity. It uses spaces as keyword delimiters. Different. Remember when I talk about how you don't put spaces in your object names, field names, table names? It's because SQL separates the keywords of the language using spaces. So if I go create space table, then I give it a table name, it, the space separates each of the words. With Java, sometimes you can actually write all the code with no spaces if you really want to, right? For bracket i equals zero, semicolon, i less than 10, semicolon, i plus plus, close bracket, curly, you know, print i, and there's actually a space, find, actually print f i, bracket, bracket, close bracket, bracket, bracket. I could write all in one line and no space that it would work. 
SQL cares about space lots. The command terminator, if you're going to issue more than one command at once, which you'll notice sometimes I, I'll put this on, sometimes I won't. But if you're going to issue more than come one command at once, you separate them using a semicolon. You guys should know about semicolons. You're programming in Java. What happens if you forget your semicolon? Okay. In SQL, you'll get an error of, you have an error somewhere near this. If you issue two commands at the same time. If you only issue one command, it assumes the last one has a semicolon. It adds a semicolon automatically in the background for you if you only issue one command. But as a rule of thumb, you should try to get into the habit of having the semicolon on there. All right, DDL. DDL is made up of three commands, more or less. Create, alter, and drop. Use create to create things, alter to change them, drop to get rid of them. So a few of you have probably heard me say you need to drop this. That means delete an object. Although delete is already used for something else. So drop means get rid of it. So you take it and you're dropping it in the garbage can. Alter it means you're going to change it. And create, well obviously create is pretty obvious. Now I am going to cover the very most basic syntax of each of these commands. Why? Because you can go online and look up the full syntax. I'm going to teach you guys the basic pieces of it. Um, for example, the documentation on Postgres for the create command, if you were to print it, is six pages long. The alter command is closer to ten pages long. No, you don't need to memorize it. Okay? You need to understand the basics of how it's done because the problem is, is MySQL's alter command is a little different than Postgres's alter command. So I'm going to teach you guys the generic versions of the command with no database specific extensions. So each database server does certain things a certain way. I'll teach you guys the basic way that works on pretty much everything. And it will do the job for most of what you need. Okay. The create command. And by the way, the syntax I'm pointing to is for Postgres 9.5. You guys are running 10 point something. Doesn't make a difference. It's all the same. If you have the slideshow, you can actually click on the link and go torture yourself trying to read through the documentation. Uh, ideally, if you don't know how to do something, you go stack overflow space PostgreSQL space create table enter. And somebody will give you an example from stack overflow in plain English. Now, the syntax is fairly straightforward. You create what, give it a name, and then you define it. And this is where I was talking about how it's pages and pages long. It's the definition, depending what you're defining, what kind of object you're creating, the definition changes. This is where the stupid, the syntax gets weird, and that's where Google is your friend. The data, like I said, depending on what you create, the syntax fluctuates. But if you were to create a table, this is the syntax for creating a basic table. I'm going to create a table called test. So it's create space table, test. You could tell the name of the object. Now the definition comes into effect. When you create a table, set of round parentheses, round brackets, depending which phrase you want to use. Then list your fields in there, one at a time, comma delimited. And how do you define a field? You define the name of the field, the data type of the field, any modifiers to the field. So, this is the name of the field. This is the data type of the field. As you can see, my awesome drawing skills. And this, anything after this, is the modifier. You don't have to have a modifier. If you just did ID big serial, it would create a, a, an ID column that's auto-incrementing. That's an integer. The primary key modifier makes it a Primary key. What does that do? It creates a unique index on it, so it cannot have duplicate values. Name. Calling a field name. Some of you may notice that the word name highlights blue when you type it into the editor, because supposedly name is a reserved keyword in the SQL language. I've never actually seen 
why it goes blue. I have no idea, because name is name. Data type is varchar 50. Yes. Literally, if you were to take your diagram you had, you know at the top where you have, we look at the diagram, you got the table name across the top? This is the table name. And then you have each of the, the inside the table we have ID, big serial with the little key next to it. That's what that is. If you go name, then you got a varchar 50. That's what it is. Not null is not null. So you want to hit that checkbox that says not null, and it puts in the little NN and makes it italics and PG modeler. That's not null. And there's the, our everybody's favorite active field, which is a Boolean. I'm telling you, it's not allowed to be null. But what's the modifier on this one, not only is it not null, I'm giving it a default value of true. Closing the bracket, semicolon. So create table test, ID serial, blah, 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 like that. What I'm going to do is I'm working in an empty database. And I'll type in these commands and show you guys what's actually going what's happening as you run it. And it will not make it uppercase or lowercase for you. But I'm actually got my finger on the shift key. It won't change the case of it for you. It will not auto format. It doesn't have any of those nice features. This the editor in PG Admin sucks. But why do we use it? Because it works. Table test. And that's the wrong ID. Big serial, primary key. Actually, big serial has to be lowercase because the data types are lowercase for some unknown reason. Name. Primary key always assumes not null. A primary key cannot be null. So when you make it primary key, it's automatically unique. It's automatically required. Primary key does all kinds of magic. No, I call it the test because I'm testing. I could call it example. <laughs> I was trying to follow what was on the slide. No, it's possible to have a default value and it still be nullable. A default value does not make it not null, it just means it'll put a value in automatically for you. You could theoretically make it null after the fact if you wanted to. So when I run this, and if everything worked right, I should get a query return successfully. How do I know if this worked? Other than, hey, you made no syntax errors. There's two ways of doing it. If you're using PG Modeler, you can refresh your table list, and there's my examples table, and there's my definition. That's how the database server sees it. And notice there's a bunch of other syntax on there that I didn't type in. The database server has a few default rules that it applies to everything you create. You can manually override the defaults. But if you use the generic syntax, it uses the database server's defaults, which is a good thing. Because probably these are things you don't want to mess with unless you know what you're doing. And you can see here's my three columns. So my command worked. It's always good when it works. As we go through this SQL thing later on next week, you'll probably see all kinds of mistakes. Because I'll make mistakes as I go. Yeah. Never mind. Okay. That's how you create a table. That syntax works on all database servers. It's when you start adding extra, the extra stuff that is server specific where things get weird. But this, the generic SQL standard, ANSI standard, I should say, create command. Yes? Yes, you can use it through pgadmin, you can go and create table. Uh, you can actually use design tools and push the syntax up. No matter what you're doing, it's actually issuing those commands in the background. Even if you're using the nice UI tools, it's still going to issue it in the background. However, should you get comfortable with the syntax? Yes. <coughs> there are times where you will not be able to open up a terminal. 
I'm going to open up a nice GUI tool. You'll, all you'll have is the command line client, and you'll have to type it all in. OK. The next command is alter. Alter allows you to change the definition of an object. It allows you to add columns, rename them, rename a table, basically anything you want to do to change the table. And actually, I'm only going to do two examples of it. Why? Because even with a table, you can alter the name of the table, rename the table. You can add a column, rename a column, drop a column, change the data type of a column, change the default of a column, add a foreign key to the column. Right? I could spend almost an entire lecture on the alter command. How much of the alter command do you need to know? You need to know how to add a column and remove a column. Anything else? What is your friend? Google's your friend. And I know a lot of students hate it when the teachers say, Google is your friend. But you know what? When it comes to stuff like this, you could go pick up a book. And the actual fact, there's one that was supposed to be included with the course. And you guys got lucky. You didn't have to pay for books this summer. But there was actually a book assigned to the course, and they took it off for the summer course, and I don't know why. So you guys got off the hook for like 300 bucks. However, I do have a copy of the, the required book, which is, you know, has a syntax for SQL in it. Is it worth buying it? No, because the online books are usually more up to date. The online resources are usually more up to date than the books, because the books were written a year ago. Just look it up. OK, so. And again, the syntax depends on each object. So if you're altering a view, which you cannot do, if you're altering an index, you're altering a function, the syntax is different on each one. Therefore, like I said, I could spend an entire lecture on alter. So I've created a table called examples. It looks like this. I'll modify it to be, OK, I'm going to alter table examples. Now I'm going to add a new column. I'm going to alter table examples. I'm going to add column email. It's a varchar 150. It's English-ish. Much more English-ish than Java is. If English isn't your first language, it might be a little rough. But it is a very English-like language. Most of the commands make sense in almost a sentence kind of way. You could actually read this almost as a sentence if you wanted to, right? Alter table, add column, email, varchar 150. It almost sounds like a sentence. And now I'm going to run it. And it ran successfully. How do I know it worked? Again, there's two ways of doing it. The first way is to refresh the view over here somewhere. Where the heck is the word refresh? There it is. And now you can see the email column has been added. Yes, the text is really small. I can't make this window. But when you go look at the recording, you'll see it. But you'll see the word email popped up at the bottom. When you add a column, it always gets added to the end of the table. In every database server except for MySQL. In MySQL, you can tell it, add a column after this column. So you can actually inject a column between two other columns. And if you have a really big table, that's usually when your data gets corrupted and your database server crashes. Just because it lets you do it doesn't mean it's a good idea. Right? Just because your motorcycle can do 250 kilometers an hour is not a good idea of doing it down the Queensway. That's, you know, because you can doesn't mean you should. Add it, it adds it to the end. Great. Now, this is a command I do like once a year when I'm teaching this lecture. So hopefully I can get the syntax right, otherwise I'll have to go look it up. Why do I not usually do this? Because I usually use the administrative tools to do it. <laughs> My, did I get it right, guys? Oh, it's the first time I think I've gotten it right in years. If I were to refresh this, you'll see email 2 became email became email 2. I renamed it. Hot damn. Now, 
I'm going to rename it back to email for later so I can do these examples a little bit better. But alter table, rename email to to email. It's pretty straightforward English. If you don't remember how to do it, you got the video, you can look it up. I'm going to run it. And believe it or not, there is a keystroke for the run button. I just don't remember what it is. I think it's F9 or F12. All right. Now I'm going to alter the table. I'm going to add another column. And by the way, the word column is optional in this case. Some database servers require you for it to be there and some don't. The ones that don't require it will still accept it. So what habit should you get into? Type the whole thing out. That way you won't be typing in the command against the server and go, add, and it's not working. Why not? Because that one server follows the standard a little more precisely than others. All right, so I added another column called CRUD because of lack of imagination. Okay, so, so far you've seen me create a table. You've seen me add a column. You watched me rename a column. Now you've watched me add a column again. So what's the next command you'd want to see? It would be You don't include the data. The data type, you just say the name of the column. So alter table examples, drop column, crud. What happens then? Crud goes away. And done. That's it. It's not complicated compared to some of the syntax you guys have experienced in Java. This is a breeze. There is some memorization. That's life. It's like any other language you're first learning. The syntax is fairly straightforward. The problem is, and I always say this, and every time I do this lecture, it's as if they said, okay, we're going to create a new language to talk to the database. Bob, go into room B. Joe, go into room A. Frank, go to room D. You're each writing these chunks of code and don't talk to each other. So whoever did the create command didn't talk to the guy who did the alter. Who also didn't talk to the guy who's going to, for the next command I'm going to talk about. Which is the drop command. And the drop command actually, I'm missing a piece of syntax in this, but it's fairly straightforward. It's the easiest one to remember. Why? Because there's no extra arguments. It's the same for everything. It's just, um, what this should read is drop object type object name. So if I were to come here, and I'm not going to do it yet. I'll do it at the end, the drop command. But the syntax would look like this. Not that. That. It would drop the table examples. I'm not going to do it now because I need a table to work with for the rest of the presentation. So I will show it to you at the end of what it does. But that is the syntax for drop. If you're dropping a view, it'd be drop space view space whatever. You drop an index is drop space index space whatever. Drop function whatever. It's you know the shortest command ever, easiest one to remember. If you want to get rid of an object, it's drop. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Now, was there a hand back there? I thought I saw a hand. No. Which leads me to the next statement. Actually, I usually do this in a minute when I'm talking about some of the other commands. Except for Oracle. And to do this in Oracle is actually really painful. I taught, I covered the labs once for this Oracle, for the Oracle course, and I wanted to cry the entire time because I hadn't touched Oracle in 20 years. Oracle is the only database server that I know of, and I'm putting this claim on it, that I know of that allows undo. There is no undo. So working with a database is like driving a car at 120 kilometers an hour down the highway with no brakes. You're going to get to where you're going, and it's going to happen fast. And you don't get a second chance. This is where you learn to do backups. And you learn how to restore a backup. 
You guys should know how to restore a backup because you did it in lab one. How to create a backup, I can show you guys that. If anybody wants to know, I'll show it to you guys in whatever, labs. There is no undo. It is traumatizing because I've done it by accident. Okay, here we go. The perfect example, okay? You say something, say just pick a word, okay? Now you just said a word. Now imagine if you're giving me a word, she's giving me a word, he's giving me a word, he gave me a word, then I want to undo your word. How do I know I have to undo everybody else's work first? Because you gave me a word, he gave me a word, he gave me a word, she gave me a word. He modified your word, but you want to undo your word. How do I know what I'm supposed to undo? There's no way. Yeah, but how do you know what was the last thing done? Because you think it was the last thing done doesn't mean it was the last thing done. It happens that, you know, a like Amazon, millions of transactions every second. And they want to go, and you want to go, oh, shoot, I made a mistake. What they do is they don't delete, they don't undo, they delete it. Right? You want to change your quantity, you update the quantity. You don't, there's no undo. Take my word for it. Oracle allows it, and it's a nightmare. Uh, essentially, Oracle allows checkpoints. So I, I, this, if I want to undo what you did, it undoes everybody else's work to get to the point where you're at. So it rolls it all back and it throws it all out with the garbage. So everybody has to redo everything it just did. So if it's a banking app, you don't want to undo. It's, it's actually undoing things is a bad idea in the database anyways. So, yeah. All right. So those are the three primary DDL commands. There's a few others, but they're database server specific. But create, alter, and drop. Those are the three that allows you to create your objects, lets you build your house, add a new window, and then you're not happy, lets you torch your house. You know, you built your house, uh, six months later, you go, oh, I don't like that many, that works. <laughs> not advocating arson, just saying. You know, that's basically what drop does. You do it, you issue the command, there's no going back. Actually, it's more like C4, but. All right. DML is the next part. I'm going to cover the first little bit today. The three commands that are easy. I'm going to teach you guys the simplest SQL select statement. And as I said before, everybody's sitting in a different room and nobody was talking. So every command syntax is different. That's the part that makes SQL the hardest to learn is that every command is different. Like how you do it is different. Why? I don't know. Everybody thought they knew best. Nobody could agree. Some database servers have gotten to the point where they're letting you borrow the syntax from another command to do the same thing. <coughs> MySQL. It's the only one that does it. It's not a good thing because it means it's not portable. You can't take commands and write it on another server. So DML is made up of four, kind of five commands. And there's a reason why I separate this from four to five. The first one is insert. Insert lets you add data. Now people say, well, why can't you use the word add? When they were creating the database commands, they were trying to let people, people visualize filing cabinets and file folders. Because that's what people, managers were coming from. That's what administrative staff was coming from, was coming from pen and paper or typewriter and paper. And when you add a file to a filing cabinet, you're usually inserting it into a folder, right? You're, at, you're inserting it into the file, thus you're inserting it. Update means you're changing the data, so you're updating the data in the database. Delete, they didn't use the word drop because, well, drop gets rid and throws it in the garbage. Delete makes it happen like it never happened. <laughs> then there's truncate. As I said, this one was added fairly recently in the 2000s, but it had been around for a while. Truncate existed when I went to school, and I took Oracle in school in 1996. And we had Truncate back then. But Truncate is like Delete, but it's like comparing a pellet gun to a Gatling gun. I like using the weaponry example because Delete is very specific. 
if you're not careful. It's not so specific, but it still works as in, I delete you, I delete you, I delete you, I delete you. Okay, I don't delete, I'll delete him, I'll skip you. Okay? But basically, you just saw what I did, right? I did it one person at a time. Truncate is, you're all gone. There's not even, hey, let's say you have a table with 10 million rows in it. It might take 20 seconds, 30 seconds to delete all 10 million rows. Truncate will do it in about a tenth of a second. What does it do? Is it basically goes to the table and says, there is no data. You have zero rows. It actually rewrites the header of the table and says, you have no data here. All the space you're occupying, it's not space. It doesn't exist. That's what truncate does. And truncate in Postgres clears the table. Truncate in MySQL even resets the auto increments. So if you were at ID number 5,000 and you do a truncate, the next ID is going to be one. Postgres, it doesn't do that because it counts the stuff differently. However, truncate is dangerous. There is no coming back from truncate. It is so fast that half the time you'll type it, hit enter, and you go, oh, crap, that's not what I, oh, well, that was. And I've done that. That's how I know how to recover from my backup really fast before anybody notices. Which is, turn off the web server, restore, turn on the web server, and they go, what happened? I don't know, web server crashed. <laughs> and you think I'm kidding. I've done it. If there's a stupid way of doing something in a database, I've done it. I speak from experience. If there's a mistake, I've done it. If it's been possibly break it, I've done it. So when I tell you guys this is dangerous, I'm serious. Because I've done it. Now, the first command I'm going to talk about is insert. The syntax is a little awkward, but it's how it goes. You want to add data to a database, specifically into a table. The syntax is insert into a table. You list the columns, then you list the values. Here's an example of inserting into test. I'm going to come over here. Now I called it examples instead. So I go insert into. So you're going to say, I'm going to add something into this table. And I called it examples. Now I'm going to break it over multiple lines. I have a column called email also. Okay, here are the three columns. Actually, this table has four columns, if you remember right. There's one called ID. Notice I did not include ID in this for a few reasons. A, reason one, A, uh, ID is auto-incrementing. It gets its own value. B, it has a default value. It gets it from the auto-increment. C, it's a primary key, and it's non-business, It's non -business, uh, what's the word? It's a, not a natural identifier. It's a, you know, it's a surrogate key. Therefore, you should never play with the surrogate keys yourself. If you set your own values in there, you're going to break something. Let the database server manage it itself. Therefore, the, if the primary key is set up to be auto-incrementing, don't include it for the ride. Now, the other thing you'll notice is I have the field names. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Is that in my mouse? Oh, the other way. Oh, that's as big as it goes. <laughs> okay, so you'll see the columns are listed one at a time. There's no quote marks. They're comma delimited. You'll notice there's no comma after the last column, so it's name, comma, active, comma, email. I'm populating three columns. Email is available. I could leave it null. I'll show you guys what, how that behaves in a second. Yes? It makes, that's the next statement. The order of the columns makes no difference as long as the data you insert matches. Let me show you. Okay, now here's another one that throws people for a loop. You'll notice I'm using single quote marks, just like a string in Java. Uh, Java is a double quotes? Okay, okay, C-sharp, it's single quotes. I was working C-sharp a couple of days ago, so you know I'm a little confused. Depending on the languages you're working with, it's either single quotes or double quotes. 
The SQL standard is single quotes. Some database servers will allow you to use double quotes. MySQL will let you use double quotes. Um, Microsoft SQL Server lets you use double quotes. I think Oracle will allow it also. Ingress will not. But they will all accept single quotes. If you use double quotes in Postgres, Postgres thinks you're talking about an object. It uses double quotes as an object identifier. So in other words, if you have an object called date, if you put it in quote marks, it says this isn't a keyword, this is the name of something. Okay? Yeah, so I don't, I, depending on what that just, there, MySQL SQL server uses square brackets for that purpose. And MySQL uses ticks. So every server does it different. But they all respect single quote marks. So if you're talking about a string, single quote mark. Active. Actually, I'm going to make it false because the default's to true anyways. False. Do you notice there's no quote marks around the word false? Why? Because it's a Boolean value. True, false. You can also feed it a zero or a one. Zero is false, one is true. You can also feed it a string, quote, T, quote, or quote, F, quote. True or false. I recommend you actually use the proper keyword, true and false. Why? Because it's probably what you're used to using in Java anyways. If you ever learn about Booleans in Java, if, if Howard ever gets around to it, <coughs> I shouldn't make fun of Howard, but you know. If Howard gets around to teaching you guys about Booleans, true, false. And then I'm going to put in an email address. And this time I did not put my personal email address up on the screen. <coughs> That's happened. There's an email address. Now I'm going to run the command. You'll notice right here, this column matches here. This column matches this. So if I were to take this and swap them and try to run it, it's better to show you guys error messages now. Here's an example of an error message. Of course, it's really tiny, and I can't make it any bigger, but I'll read it to you. It says, invalid input syntax for type of Boolean, Dan. Dan is not a Boolean. Dan is a string. What's happening is I'm mix matching the column to the data going into it. That means if you're going to insert something into a string column, it has to be a, if into a varchar character text, it has to be a string. If you're inputting into a numeric field, it has to be a number. If it's going to a Boolean, it has to be a Boolean. That's all there is to it. I'm going to show you guys the, last, the other error message that you may see. I've got three columns, two values. Error message you get is this. Insert has more target columns than expressions. Postgres's error messages are actually really useful. Some other database servers, the error messages are really cryptic. Microsoft SQL server is really weird. Some, some of the error messages it gives you. MySQL is even dumber. Like it'll give you some error code. Error number, colon, near this word. In this case, it'd be error number near closing bracket. Well, that's useful. Then you go look up what that error message means. That error number means that, oh, I'm missing a column. I'm a tool. Now I'm going to run it, and it should work. Please. One row affected, 11 milliseconds execution time. It's very fast. Depending on how old your laptop is, it might be a little slower. <laughs> you know. But realistically, inserting a simple row like this to a simple table, it should be fast no matter how bad your computer is. Now, how can you tell what's in here? Normally, I teach this command right at the end, but I'll do it right now. This is the quintessential SQL command. Hey, did you guys have to do Hello World yet in Java? This is the SQL version of Hello World. <laughs> I'll actually explain the pieces more later. But I ran the command. It's really small at the bottom. When you look at the video online, it'll actually be a decent size. There's the row of data I just inserted. Now, I'm going to change this out, and I'm going to run this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. OK. 
okay, and then I want to redo that, redo it again. Here's 11 rows of the same information. Yes. I ran them one at a time, but I could put, I could put 10 in a row and hit run, it would do 10 times. I just hit run 10 times. Every single time you hit the run button, it happens. It doesn't ask you, you sure you want to do this. It, you know how everybody's so used to using a computer and you go, are you sure you want to do this? The database server assumes you know what you're doing. Like I said, you're driving down the highway at 120 kilometers an hour and you have no brakes. And actually, you'd have, probably have a steering wheel. You know, you're going to have to pull off a Fred Flintstone. If you don't get the reference, go look that up. It's, you know, you're going to be braking with your feet. It's rough. So... I've added myself 11 rows of data. So that was the insert command. You could insert only a single column if you wanted to. And I'm actually going to do this. I'm going to get rid of email because I didn't make email not null. So now I'm going to run it. One more time. Again, nothing complained. And like I said, it's not case sensitive. If I look at the 12th, you'll see. If I don't require a value and it allows a null value, it just looks that it's empty right now. But if I were to actually pull it up raw, as in if I were going to use programming language and retrieve the record out of the database, something like Java or PHP, email column would actually have a null value in it. It wouldn't be an empty string, it'd be null. It just, this editor doesn't show nulls. It just, leaves as an empty box. But that's, if you insert only two rows, it doesn't fill in all the columns. You can insert one column, you can insert all the columns, you can insert a subset of the columns. It makes no difference, as long as your syntax is correct. So that's insert. Okay, the update command. Hot damn, this is fantastic. As I said, everybody was sitting in a different room and nobody was talking. Update is used to change the value of a row of data. And uh, basically the syntax is update, name of the table, set, then you do in key value pairs. Do you guys know what a key value pair is? A key value pair means you have a key, usually a field name, that's going to be equal to a value. Key value pair. So you have a column that's going to be equal to a value. The key identifies the name of the column. The value is what you're going to shove into it. When you get around to learning about arrays in Java, you'll learn about key value pairs or hash tables, depending on what phrase they use in Java. Now, at the end, you'll notice I've got these square brackets around with the where condition. I'll be teaching you guys about where next week because where can get really long. But where is basically a filter. You're saying where the rule matches this. And if you don't include the where, so if I were to say update test set name equal to working, without the where, what would happen? Everything gets affected. If you don't include a where clause, it affects everything. The where says affe affect only these specific rows. Like I said, I'll be teaching you guys about where next week. There's only so many hours in a lecture. And as always, I provided a handy link to the SQL documentation for where. So, at the bottom you can see 12 doesn't have an email address. So I'm going to go... Okay, we know the ID column is 12, although you guys can't see it because the screen's so small. But essentially, I'm going to change the last row and set it to that. And I'm going to run it. No errors. Now, you'll notice I'm leaving the command in there. Here's a little trick for this at particular editor. You can have more than one command in your add command buffer, but if you want to run just the one command, you can highlight it and hit the run button. 
So it had just ran the select. And you can see I updated row 12, and now it's no longer null. If you, if you have three or four commands or five or six commands in your command buffer, but you only want to run, run the one, you highlight it, then you hit run. It'll run whatever's been highlighted and treat that as a command. Yep. So I'm going to modify record number one. Now I'm editing two columns this time. I'm updating the value in two separate columns. As you can see, actually I'll break that down over multiple rows so it's a little easier to read. So it's a little easier to read this way. Update examples, I'm going to set the name to Homer. Email is going to be no reply at some email.com. And I'm going to alter record number one. And this is where people that come from other database servers from Postgres, because I know there's a few people in here that have used MySQL, a couple of people have used Microsoft SQL Server, you'll notice one really big behavior difference. So I'm going to run this command. Include my semicolon, I'm going to hit the run button. And it's going to run all of it. So that it actually did the update, but you never saw it. But you can see the results right away. Now, here's the difference between Postgres and other database servers. Row number one went to the end. Now, other servers actually do extra work to keep it in the original sort order. Postgres, for performance reasons, chooses not to. So this leads me to explain to you what the behavior of an update is inside the database server. The way it works is this. You're going to say, I'm going to update row number one. And it does a series of steps. It goes, oh, you want to update row number one? Good. Row number one marked dirty. It goes, now I'm going to take the value of the card. I'll take number one. I'm going to copy it to the end of the table. I'll change the values and then write it. So it'll take the first row, clone it, change the applicable values, and write it. And then the original row is marked as empty and dead. It's still there, but it's now marked as deleted. Not as deleted, but as trash. And the new row goes to the bottom. It does this for performance reasons, because if Microsoft SQL Server would then take the time to rewrite it. It would, actually ins it would actually gap the table, insert the row, and then mark the other one off. Technically, yes. But it, imagine if you took a file on your hard drive, so on your computer. This works for Mac and for Windows. Take a file, copy it. You know what? And Windows will do copy of whatever file. I don't know what it does on a Mac, but you know, you take the file, you copy it right next to each other, and then what it does then is you can rename the new file, then you delete the original file. That's what it's doing. But the file is not actually deleted; it's been marked as gone. Database servers have a process called trash collection. In Postgres, it's known as vacuuming. What does vacuuming do? Is it looks through the database at all these dirty records and actually then deletes them out of the database. So it doesn't do it right away because it requires extra processing power to do it. It does it nightly. It, or whenever it notices that the table starts getting junked up, it'll run the cleaning cycle. Yes? If this process, it, it, yes, it act, it'll add one more row more for the space on your disk. It'll occupy a little bit more, which is why the vacuum will come through and clean out all those records and make those spaces available. The database table gets fragmented at that point, just like a hard drive, which you may learn in Computer Essentials about fragmented hard drives. If you have a file here, you have a file here, and you have a file here, and you delete this file, then the record gets written here kind of thing, and it goes down there. The, there's our additional commands for the vacuuming where it tells it to actually collapse the table down so it defragments the table. There's all kinds of extra stuff. It's not stuff you need to worry about. The database server does it for you most of the time automatically. Yes? Yeah. Back to the top? No. It is where it is in Postgres. How would you change it? You could. All, you could change your select statement to actually order it in the order you want. That's a couple of lectures down the road. But that's the update command. That's all there is to it. That's what happens. It writes it to the database by marking the other one dirty. 
So it'll always sort at the bottom. It's just other database servers lie. Or they go through the extra steps so that it's not disconcerting. But you know who actually looks at the raw data out of the database? Not the end users. The admins and the developers. And we really don't care what the order of the data, the data is in because the order of the data means nothing. Absolutely nothing. What, who cares what order? Yeah, like one day you could have the students sitting in this order. The next, next week I could have a totally different set of students in the front row. Does it make a difference to me? No. As long as you're all in the room, I'm okay. Just what happens this spot got taken up this week and somebody else, you know, whatever. So that's the update command. This is the syntax for the update command. It doesn't change. The number of columns, you can do one column, two columns, five columns, all the columns. Which one should you never update? Your primary key. That's just a bad idea. And now what I'm going to do is just show you guys what happens if you don't include your where statement. Because, you know, you got to see what happens. And this is affecting 12 rows, so this should take all of, oh, 12 milliseconds. That includes the data retrieval. Now all the data is the same. Dan made it boo-boo. Does the can Dan recover from this? No. It's called restoring from a backup. And if you're eight hours into your workday, TFB. And if you don't know what that means, go look it up. <laughs> it's too something bad. He's going to write it out for you. <sighs> TFB. The next command is delete. Delete is used to get rid of data. Again, delete from whatever the table is, where condition. If you don't include the where clause, what happens to your data? It's gone. Not quite. Like I said before, truncate is you, 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 you. Not you. Right? But delete does one row at a time. You can actually technically interrupt it. Technically. Is it a good idea to do that? No. But you could theoretically do a stop. And you can kill the command, and sometimes you won't delete everything, depending on how fast you did it. So trust me, the database server is a lot faster than you are. Even if you're dealing with millions of rows of data, it's usually a lot faster than you. By the time you realize you made a mistake, and after you're done sweating and panicking, it's too late. So I'm going to delete this data. Oh, come on. That just happened. Doesn't make a difference if you have a space on the equals, beside the equal sign or not, just so you know. I'm going to run this command. Yes. Somebody said but. No? Oh. Now I'm going to go run. And you'll see that now there's only 11 rows in the database because one's been deleted. How fast did that happen? 12 milliseconds on my laptop. That includes the search for the data, the retrieval, and the display of the data, 12 milliseconds. If you're working with a large database, 14 milliseconds. You're never going to see it. So I can delete another one. I'm going to go run again. Two is gone. Congratulations. And I can delete seven. It doesn't make a difference where I delete from. Now seven's gone. You can't really see it from the back, but you'll see that it goes... Uh, two, three, four, five, six, eight, because seven's been deleted. It's instant. It's a uh, delete, delete. Uh, no, it deletes the entire row. It nukes the whole. I'm not deleting seven. I'm deleting row with identifier seven. Yeah, ID column seven. I could also go delete where email is equal to... No reply at some email.org. And it would delete anything that matches that. Later on when I show you the where clause, like next class, 
it'll make more sense. I had a hand over here. Yes. You have to speak up a bit. I can't hear you because people are talking. In Postgres, you shouldn't. Because Postgres uses a sequence, a clicker, to count one, two, three, four, five. It manages your next value for you. Could you? Theoretically, yes. But you'd have to write code to make sure that that ID is not new. So you'd have to go insert this, set ID to eight, where, you know, ID is not equal to eight or something. Like. You'd have to set these weird rules. And you'd have to do a lot of code to figure it out. And so you'd actually have to, have to get your application to actually query the database two, three times to find out if you could do this. And then while you're doing this, somebody else could actually add an eight. So should, if you're using auto-incrementing keys or identity keys, depending on which database server you're using, don't mess with the, uh, the primary keys. If you deleted a row, it's gone. You can't reuse that number. It's a bit like if you go to the, to the uh, Ministry of Transportation, sorry, Service Ontario, and you're going to renew your driver's license. The person ahead of you grabbed the, a stub. They're number 55. You're number 66. 56. After five minutes, he realizes he doesn't need to be there. And he throws out the 55. Person comes in behind you. They're going to grab 57. They're never going to see 55 because it's been used. Once it's used, it's not available again. Or because you can read, because somebody could come in and pick up the paper off the floor you know, really, you shouldn't do that. Yes. Yep, it deletes the entire row of data. Yes and no. Yes, if the rules are set up properly when you create the foreign keys. Some of you have know, may have noticed when you're creating your relationships in PG Modeler where there's some options on on delete, do this. There's a, I, I, I let you guys use accept all the defaults, which is do nothing, which means if you delete a row and there's child records, it says, no, you're not allowed to do this. And it bombs out. You can actually turn on on delete cascade. If you delete that row, it deletes that child table's rec matching records, and then it'll go and keep crawling down the entire family tree. So theoretically, you could delete, you know, a call a, a row from this table and delete, you know, rows from 20 other tables. Unless you're really sure that's what you want to do, don't use cascading deletes. They're dangerous. You can, but you shouldn't. I just finished explaining why you should not do this. The amount of work that you have to do to make, be able to make that happen is dangerous. Because there's a chance somebody else might, if you allow it and somebody else tries to do the same thing at the same time, both of you could be trying to set a row to the same value and you'll have duplicate primary keys and then the server goes, no, I hate you. Just don't do that. Don't mess with the primary keys, especially if they set themselves automatically. Don't touch them. It's just the safe way. Then you, here, I'll try this again. If you delete primary key seven, seven no longer exists, you're not allowed to use it again. We'll keep it simple. Because you can reuse it, doesn't mean you should reuse it. Okay? Use update. So let's say you want to clear just one value and you want to get rid of one person's email address, then use an update and you set that field to null or to an empty string depending on the case may be or you set it to zero or you set it to false or whatever. If you want to change the, v if you want to erase just one value, you use update. If you want to get rid of the whole row, use delete. Now, again, I showed you guys what happens when you do an update without the where clause. I'll do a delete without the where clause, just for everybody's enjoyment. And we've all noticed so far it's taken 12 milliseconds, and that took 11 milliseconds. It's all gone now. There is no coming back. Deleted. 
Okay. No, oh, it's, it's gone. It, it not, it's, there's no waste basket. It's like truncate, yes, except what it did, there was 11 rows, so it said 11 times, you're deleted, you're deleted, you're deleted, you're deleted. Truncate says, none of you ever existed. So I'll demonstrate truncate next. Uh, let me get back to my insert. One, two, three, four. All right, so here's a, my primary keys have gone up from 13, even though I deleted the contents of the table. Primary key started at 13, and it's counting because it doesn't go back. It's like how you leave a good relationship. You never go back after it's done. You just walk away, right? You just don't go back. It's the same thing. They, Primary keys, you don't go back. Don't touch the old stuff, it's never good. Okay, so there's the select. I showed you guys the delete. If I go truncate examples. And of course, for the absolute most dangerous command in the database, it's the easiest one to remember. <laughs> truncate example. Now, as somebody asked earlier, can you delete the child records? This will delete the table and everything that's ever been related to it. It's like saying, I wish my ex-wife's family never existed. <laughs> or ex-husband, as the case may be. I gotta be. I gotta keep it fair, right? I just wish my in-laws never existed. From the grandfather on, everybody's gone forever. It's terrible how easy this is to happen. So, how fast does this actually run? Now, this took 22 milliseconds. Why did it take longer than the delete? Because in this case, the delete was working with very little data. The truncate actually modifies the table structure. It actually rewrites the header of the table structure. So imagine I said, I truncate the members of this classroom. What it would actually do is it would take all of you and basically, in my mind, erase the fact you exist. So it has to take the step to tell my mind that you guys don't exist, never existed, never happened, gone. So it takes a few, a, a few extra CPU cycles for it to, to actually rewrite it. Now, if you were working with 10 million rows of data, it would have to go, you're deleted, you're deleted, you're deleted 10 million times. On the other hand, I say, Dan, these people never existed. Okay, that took a, a little bit longer to tell me it didn't happen, but because it's so much less that it needs to deal with than the delete one at a time. A truncate on a larger set is faster than an individual delete, especially when you're cascading. Because if you cascade a delete individual, it'll go, oh, delete you, now we're gonna delete you, you, and then you, 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 oh, and you, you, you too while we're at it. But what we really have to do is we have to delete you, 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 then you, 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 then her. Because it's gotta do it backwards. So what it does when you do a cascade delete is it crawls all the way down the tree to figure out everything that's related Starts at the bottom and starts deleting all the way back up. With the truncate, it goes, okay, anything related to this is deleted, okay. There's all stuff related to this too? Well, that's gone too. It, it goes from the top and just burns the forest down. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's fun. Yes. Yeah, but the sequence is not reset. So this is the difference between Postgres and some other database servers. So other database servers that use an auto increment type, such as MySQL, the truncate actually, when it rewrites the table, it goes, nothing ever happened. With Postgres, it's more like, none of this happened, but anything where you might get some information from, they still exist. So the sequences still exist and they're still set. So you'd have to reset the sequence also. It doesn't rewrite the table. Postgres just empties the table. MySQL, it actually rewrites the table. So different database servers implement truncate differently. You have to be careful.
Oh, I've already done select. Select is used to retrieve data. There's much syntax. And I used to have a picture of the much wow dog. Then I redid the slides and I lost my picture. I already covered select star from examples. This is the only part of select I'm going to cover today. It's enough to do the next lab, lab six. Why do I not cover more of it? Because I'm going to spend the next three weeks on select. The next three weeks on select. Uh, why? Because select has so much syntax. And it's, like I said, how often do you build your house? Once. How often do you add a new window? Once every 20 years. I know how often do you change the, the doors in your house? You know, maybe once, twice. Maybe you're going to redo your, your rugs or your floor. You do that every, every five to ten years. That's stuff that happens occasionally. How often do you let people in and out of your house? Unless you're at stay at, you know, unless you're in neat. Odds are, you know, people are coming in and out of your house on a regular basis. And how do you find out who's in the house? That's what you do the most, is you're, you're asking, who's here? Like when I was taking attendance, right? I'm going, who's here? Who's here? Who's here? That's selects. You're constantly asking for information. Yes, you do. Lab one. I showed you how. You know, I told you, database tree, right click, new database, type in whatever you want. It's DDL. Okay, so what should you be working on this week? Lab five is due next week. Lab six is assigned next week. There, the test is done as of midnight. You cannot do it anymore. It'll disappear. If you didn't do it, that's too bad. Assignment one, once again, I'll repeat it at the end of the, of the recording so that somebody's not here. It's due tonight. One week grace period, then it goes away. Then you get a goose egg. It's life. Goose egg means zero. Other than that, that is it. Should you, be, you should also be starting to do the hybrids. Now we're going to get closer to the Postgres hybrids. You're not ready to do hybrid, the, the, hi, the first Postgres hybrid, which I think is hybrid five? Four. Four or five. Whichever one it is where I tell you to go do PG exercises. Do it next week, after the next lecture. You're not ready for it today. So that's it. So not a lot of homework this week. Away you go. I'm going to stop my recording. Give me a minute to save my stuff before you rush me.